Good afternoon and welcome to uh, everybody. Uh, I can tell you that, uh, well, we are in a fantastic uh, school. We have had uh, great events here in uh, China, Europe, International Business School. But what is going to happen uh, today is very, very special because uh, when you think about the, uh, the speakers uh, this afternoon, uh, you will understand that uh, there is, uh, this is an extraordinary uh, panel. You know that uh, we are here to discuss this issue of peace and security in the 21st century, and actually, uh, of course, we could spend one semester about uh, this uh, very complicated topic. Unfortunately, time is limited. We will have to stop at uh, 4.30. So I don't want to uh, speak uh, too much here, but I just would like, on behalf of uh, all of you, on behalf of uh, the entire CIBS family, uh, to thank and to welcome uh, all the panelists uh, who are here uh, this afternoon with us and please join me to warmly welcome our panelists. Uh, the first speaker of the afternoon, and you remember the rule uh, of the game, we are here, it's a, it's a classroom. Uh, so the classroom is flat, and we are here to exchange ideas, uh, views, and to debate to a certain, a certain extent. But first of all, we will have a series of remarks by our guests, and the first uh, speaker, if I may say, I am not going to spend time to introduce him because you have uh, the CV of uh, the, the, the speakers already, uh, but I would like to say that the first speaker has been two times uh, Prime Minister of uh, Italy, and of course, as you all know, because we studied that in uh, class very recently, also President of the European Commission, from 1999 to 2004. And I would like to tell you, but you know already, but uh, Romano Prodi is uh, a friend of CIBS, he's on the faculty at CIBS, but even more important, he's a European friend of China. So let us welcome Professor Romano Prodi. Thank you, David. I'm always happy to be here. And uh, uh, now, it's not the first time that uh, we meet. Uh, my task today is to make a very short introduction because the agreement is that we talk shortly and then we discuss uh, lengthily. Uh, peace and security in the 21st century. Military, political problem, economic problem, and then uh, environmental, food, and so on. Uh, third one, there are three main challenges. First one is obviously the demographic problem. Even if, even if uh, uh, our population is now 6.9 billion people, in the middle of the century will be 9 billion people. And so an increase of 2 billion, that is an enormous increase, but much less than the forecast of 20 years ago. And the forecast were to arrive to 12 billion people in the middle of the century. This is not the case, but the consequence, the problems of the increase of population, 2 billion increase, uh, and the change of diet, of food, uh, habits, in most parts of the world, starting from Asia, from China, will increase the necessity of food. So the first big uh, new problem will be food, because productivity in agriculture is not anymore increasing at 3% per year as it was from in the 80s and the 90s, but is increasing only 1% per year. So, competition in food. This means competition in water and 
competition in water will be one of the most terrible issues of the future. If you think to the Nile River, with the split of Sudan, with the fact that there is not enough water for the new needs of population, this will be one of the hot points in the uh, hot spots in the world. But uh, 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 the same problem will be between Turkey and, uh, and Syria, and uh, you may expect that uh, scarcity of water and scarcity and linked to the scarcity of food will become one of the hot issues of the next century. And of course, uh, uh, parallel to this, the problem of uh, raw materials. So you have this problem, and the link of all that will be the environmental uh, uh, issue. Now, different from only 10 years ago, this is a common worry now, even if technically there are many different, everybody is worried about environment. But how this will enter into international competition will be a point of conflict or not, it, it is still a question mark. This is the picture of, uh, let's say, the strategic issue of this century. Thank you, uh, Mr. President, for uh, these uh, remarks, fascinating as always. I would like also to, to welcome uh, members of the CIBS faculty. Thank you very much, uh, Horst, uh, for being with us uh, this afternoon. Uh, the second um, speaker, again, you know him uh, very well. You have read uh, many things about uh, the second speaker, but I would like just to tell you one or two things. Uh, Mr. Laurent Fabius has been uh, Prime Minister of uh, France uh, in the uh, 80s, and of course I see a lot of young people uh, here uh, sitting uh, in this room, but uh, if my recollection is correct, uh, Prime Minister Fabius uh, has been Prime Minister at 37, and uh, the youngest uh, French Prime Minister ever in the entire French uh, history. Uh, Prime Minister Laurent Fabius has been also two times President of the French National Assembly, Minister of Economy, Minister of Budget, uh, Minister of Finance, Minister of Industry. Well, uh, uh, absolutely extraordinary uh, expertise. And it's a great, great, great honor for all of us here at CIBS, but I am also talking on behalf of the, of the class to have uh, Mr. Laurent Fabius with us. Mr. Laurent Fabius is also a strong friend of China, very strong friend of CIBS. He came uh, to us in 2005, February 2005, to speak about uh, Europe, uh, the European integration, the EU, and the articulation between the EU and China. And he has been two times with us at the Euro-China Forum, once in Kiev, capital of Ukraine, and once in 2009 in the beautiful city of Tianjin in uh, China. So really, it's a great, great, great honor uh, to have the chance, the opportunity to exchange with uh, Prime Minister Laurent Fabius. Let us welcome the Prime Minister. Thank you very much, and I'm very pleased to be once more here. Uh, my speech will be easier because uh, I fully agree with Romano Podi has just said to us, and uh, I don't want to repeat what he has uh, said in an excellent way. Uh, maybe I will add four or five comments. The first one, and I think all of us will agree with that, is that we are not, and uh, probably we shall not be any more confronted with the choice of war or peace in a world shared into classical blocks. Uh, we are confronted with a more tricky situation with the chaotic reorganization of a world which for at least 20 years uh, have not yet found its post-Cold War equilibrium. 
And uh, my first um, assessment will be this one. Uh, there is a global trend for what I would call the shakings, the shaking of uh, the financial capitalism, the shaking of industrial world, the shaking of the so-called peaceful coexistence, the shaking of the demography and so on, and also the risk of uh, ecological, energy, food asphyxiation, with some fundamental facts. Uh, in front of these challenges, the West has no more the monopoly or even the advantage of power. Mano uh, pointed that, and it's quite accurate. Uh, newcomers, or maybe not so newcomers, are more and more decisive. China, India, Brazil, and so on. And no country or no region can decide any longer for the rest of the world. And therefore, the concept of security or insecurity is looser and wider than it used to be before. Uh, second, uh, we have to face uh, multiple and interdependent challenges for the whole world. Now, a third remark, uh, the new name of peace is development. All of us probably uh, share that view, but when it comes to uh, real decisions and real facts, it's much more difficult. Because on the one hand, the rich countries have to uh, share development. And you know, for many viewpoints, and particularly from a financial viewpoint, uh, it's not the case. Now, uh, two other remarks before uh, my conclusion. Obviously, we have to focus on the military problems themselves. Uh, because uh, you cannot speak about peace and security in this century without uh, being more precise on, on these issues. Uh, first, the, the subject of the, uh, proliferation and, on the other hand, nuclear disarmament, uh, the old way of approaching uh, these problems uh, is no longer uh, very efficient. Uh, there is, as far as I see it, a positive uh, attitude of both uh, China, uh, America, uh, with uh, President Obama. Uh, Russia shows signs of opening. Uh, Great Britain and, 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 and France as well. Uh, we must probably bring a successful conclusion to this because otherwise uh, there is quite a menace of proliferation. And we must bear in mind that today conventional weapons provoke every year more death, much more death than uh, biological, chemical or nuclear weapons. And therefore uh, we have to try and conclude an international treaty to regulate, not forbid, but regulate the business of weapon, uh, which uh, would put an end to this reality, which is obviously a great danger uh, for the world. And uh, I will end this uh, very uh, quick uh, survey in saying, by saying that obviously many things will depend on the relationship between China and America, hopefully peaceful, and European Union. Uh, obviously, EU should play a role in those matters because uh, it has no uh, expansion will or hidden objective. And there has been some uh, development in the fields of foreign policy or defense. 
But uh, our common view to Romano and myself is that until now too limited and uh, we still act as not only nations, which is fair, normal, but not enough in a European way. Uh, and it's a pity because uh, I think that, that the ideology of, of a European approach could be the ideology of cooperation and harmony and dialogue that we need. Now, uh, immediately, uh, we have to face uh, conflicts uh, with uh, a, a great risk. Uh, Iran, Israeli-Palestinian conflict, Afghanistan, and so on. And probably it will be interesting to have a discussion uh, even short about these uh, subjects. Of course, we are going to go on the discussion on Friday. Uh, our colleague, uh, Professor Rolf Kramer, will moderate uh, a panel on the role of the state in the 21st century. So I would like to thank you. I would like to thank uh, the panelists for coming. It's very uh, precious for all of us. Let me add uh, the, the following comment, because, President, in your introductory remarks, you spoke about the 21st century as the century of Asia. And you said, well, some people, they, 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 people who are uh, behind this idea, they said that the 18th, 19th century, they were the century of Europe, 20th century, the century of the US, certainly the second half of it. And then the 21st century has to be, in, to a certain extent, the century of Asia. But uh, here I think we have something better to do to work on the 21st century as the century of the world, the century of the world cooperation. Uh, and uh, to achieve that, our friend from India left, but we need to uh, think about the new uh, global governance. We did not speak much today about the G20, but maybe um, it will come in the following uh, days on, on, on Friday. But in order, in any case, to build this new global governance, probably as President Liotti said, we need uh, this idea of a new humanism, but it will be connected also with our capacity to educate citizens of the world, citizens of the world. And this is a very, very big question. How do we, how can we educate citizens of the world? And I am very proud uh, to be a part of this CIBS story because here, what, when I look at what we are doing today, when I think about the questions, when I look at the students here, I think that we are on the way to try to do our best to educate citizens of the world. So thank you very much to all of you, and let's continue the dialogue and build the friendship.